Hello, and welcome to the Physique Development Podcast. Today, we're going to be doing a rapid Q&A. Coach Alex, first, can I take you out on a date? <laughs> you can. TikTok was, uh, we can talk about that a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> so we had our first viral moment of, of TikTok the other day, <laughs> and um, they, it was a, a question and answer just like this with Sue and I, and Sue was asking the question, and a, a handful of the comments were saying that she had the hots for me. I um, do, in fact, and, have yes, the hots for him. <laughs> she does, in fact, have the hots for me, so much so that she married me. It's crazy. Um, so yeah, we found that very funny as that was a handful of the comments that, that came through. Yeah. So go check out our TikTok, shameless plug, physique <laughs> development underscore, same as our Instagram. Uh, but we're going to get into some questions that you all asked over on Instagram, and we're just going to go ahead and get started. So what are your best recovery tips outside of nutrition and sleep? Outside of nutrition and sleep. I mean, those two are going to be your biggest ones. I think that getting movement outside of your resistance training is going to be another very important component. Um, getting your steps in and not just being a, a dog on a log um, outside of your training sessions. So getting that circulation of blood flow and those different factors is going to be very important. Love it. What would you add? Sleep. Again. <laughs> so just double up on sleep. Double up on sleep. That's the only answer here. But Coach Alex, what are the best hamstring exercises? The best hamstring exercises. Um, you don't have a whole lot to choose from within hamstring exercises, but you do have the seated and lying hamstring curl, and you also have um, a stiff-legged RDL. I would say that those three are going to be fantastic tools. I often prefer to utilize the trap bar relative to a barbell or utilizing um, – I guess dumbbells would still work, but I would prefer to utilize the trap bar relative to the barbell in that setting. Awesome. Blossom. I absolutely love training hamstrings and all of those exercises. We actually got to use a seated leg curl for the first time in quite some time recently. Uh, it did not live up to the hype because <laughs> the, the equipment was a little bit broken down, but we're excited to hopefully get a seated leg curl. If you haven't seen our home gym tour, we talked about the different machines that we have as well as what we are wanting to get or things that we would like to get, which leads me into the next question. If you were to redo your home gym, what are the three things that you would pick? I would start with the Prodigy Rack. That would be the first thing. I would have the set of dumbbells. Is that fair? Yeah, that's Okay. Fair. So I'd have my full set of dumbbells, the Prodigy Rack, and I guess it, it would be the one of the benches. Mm -hmm. It'd have to be. So it'd be the, the Prodigy Bench and then the Prodigy Rack alongside the rack of dumbbells. And Austin joined us now, so we'll go ahead and ask him, if he were to create his dream home gym, what would be the top three pieces of equipment that you would get? Ooh, dream home gym. Um, I think I would go for, well, this is going to be my situation almost. I mean, I only really have room at the new spot for three things. So it would be... The Prodigy Rack, for sure, from Prime. I share that. Uh, I think that's a no-brainer for anyone in a home gym. Um, the combo units, uh, lying leg curl leg extension from Prime, which is what I'm going to go with, and then a set of dumbbells. I think that's, if a set of dumbbells can count as right. a <laughs> piece of equipment, then yeah, I'm definitely going to do that. Uh, so that, that's definitely my three pieces. And that's what I'm going to go with at the new spot anyway. So. Yeah. The bench is kind of like a and a part of the prodigy rack. Like you can't really have the prodigy rack without having a bench or, you know, having the dumbbells without a bench. So um, I'm counting the bench in the yeah, prodigy it's tough. Rack. Yeah. It, it feels like you're yeah. getting robbed of a piece of equipment. Like I would prefer to have a leg curl and a leg extension as like my third piece, the combo piece. But if I have to include the bench, then I've, you know, got to have the bench. Oh, did I cheat? Okay. Well, kind of, but. <laughs> well, you're just going to have to do all your exercises on the floor. <laughs> That's fine. I'll take that. <laughs> well, going into, since we learned about the best glute exercises or your favorite glute exercises and your favorite hamstring exercises, when it comes to growing those big meaty quads, if you want to be like Quadzilla, AJ Dillon, what are the exercises that you want to be doing? 
The exercise that I would say is going to be the quad focused split squat and then really perfecting your leg extensions. And then three, um, I guess the leg press, the quad focused leg press. Do you have a, do you have a third there that you would prefer? I think that like you do the split squat well and you do the leg extension extremely well. Those two exercises are going to be stellar. I know that somebody in the comments here is going to be like, what about the barbell back squat? It's like, sure, but we have some structural things that are going to come into play from person to person. Whereas with the split squat, we can have all the flexibility in the world in terms of the setup and those different factors. So it sets up nicely for everyone because we can structure it to the person person rather than the individual who is uh, in a barbell back squat where we may not have the tools to structure it specifically to them. Um, I guess the third thing that came to my mind was the uh, like a trap bar deadlift. I would say something heel elevated like a trap bar deadlift like that. Um, a heel elevated squat for sure. And I, I think I think if you're going to include a heel elevated trap bar, you can it's going to be the same general motion or bottom position relative to the the heel elevated barbell back squat. So I would say those are pretty interchangeable. I'd say that's a, that's a solid third if I had to add a third to that. Yeah. And one thing I'll say, because when we talked about the glute exercises and talked about the glute bias leg press being a top exercise, and there were comments saying, what about the barbell back squat? And exactly what Alex said, but also to add on to that, if we're thinking about where we're challenging the tissue, when we look at a leg press and when we look at a back squat, it's going to be challenging the quads and the glutes, depending on how you're biasing the movement in the lengthened positions. So not to say they their exact same movement movement, but they can be interchangeable because of how they're challenging the tissue. Right. And I think that these, like when we're answering these type of questions, an important piece is that these are just components of a well-structured program in general. So there's going to be other movements that are going to be utilized when we speak you know, past our favorites. I, I promise you there are some exercises that are not on my favorites list that I know that I need to execute on um, that I may not be as great at or I may not enjoy as much, but I know that they have great benefit. And so um, these are just components of a well-constructed program for whatever you're focusing on. Yeah. So Austin, let's say you're in a fat loss phase and you want to travel for the week. Should you continue following the program or should you stop for that week? Ooh, I think it's going to be really relative to the individual themselves, what their ultimate goal is um, in the timeline of that goal. I think timeline is huge here uh, in this because I've been on vacations for multiple peak weeks, may I add. <laughs> I would not recommend, um, but I have done it uh, multiple times and came out, uh, in, in a good position. So I would say for the, the person who's probably going to be asking this question, I would say while you're traveling, that could be a great time to take a step back, uh, relax a little bit, maybe start, you know, if you are someone who's tracking, maybe go towards protein and calories in terms of what you're tracking, uh, maybe loosen up, loosen up a little bit on those, uh, on those heartstrings as far as your deficit goes. But I know it's going to, it's going to change dependent on the individual and kind of the approach you've been taking up to that point, uh, with your coach. So, uh, Sue, do you have anything else to add on that? Yeah, I would also take into consideration where your headspace is at and what that trip is going to be. So there have been times that I've traveled and it's just pretty easy to stay on track and to stay in the routine that I'm in. And there's other trips that I go on that I want to be more present and more in the moment. So for example, we're actually traveling here in the next few days. And the first part of the trip, it's going to be relatively easy for me to just stay on routine. So there's no reason for me to think, oh, I'm just going to go ahead and get out of this because I'm traveling. But the later half of the travel, we are going to be enjoying some time with friends. So I'm going to enjoy that time and be present and be able to be a little bit off my routine. So being able to think about where your headspace is, as well as what the trip is itself. And then like Austin said, the length of the diet and what all you've done before and after is going to all feed into it. 
Yeah. And both these, both these guys have given you guys awesome answers. So I'm going to give you my personal answer to what I do in this scenario is that I look for the gym that is going to have the most unique equipment, equipment that I haven't touched before and get to play on a playground and use a bunch of different equipment that I don't get to use all the time and and try different things. And I think that that's a, a beautiful aspect. If you are someone who just enjoys training in those different aspects, you don't, you're not in, you're not in prep. You're not doing anything specific from a, a performance goal standpoint. Uh, um, browsing around, getting on Instagram, seeing what different pieces of equipment gyms have, I think is a really fun way of, of adding an, a new component or a fun component to your, to your travels. Yeah. So coach Alex, you've worked with a lot of females have. or women, <laughs> and you've worked with a lot of men when it comes to choosing exercises and the best exercises, what, what are you going to do to differentiate those? Between what? Between the like, and male women. and female? <laughs> <laughs> Their goals? <laughs> um, so in terms of differentiating, I, I think that it's going to be dependent on the goals or the muscle groups that they're wanting to, to target, um, as well as structurally, how do they look? Do they have any imbalances? Is there things that we're seeing from a left to a right side? Do we need to utilize more unilateral work? Um, do we have an imbalance from an anterior to a posterior perspective? Um, is the individual feeling as though that they are quad dominant and they're wanting to grow their their glutes and they feel as though that the exercises that they, that they are performing for their glutes, they're getting a lot of quad activation. So we need to go through the exercise execution, see where things are at and get a better priority on the posterior chain and utilizing exercise exercises that are going to train that tissue better than what they were previously selecting. So a lot of the work that we do is going to be um, improving exercise selection as well as uh, getting them into a better execution of those exercises that are in place. Because um, for instance, there was a client today that uh, she's been working with myself for the last eight weeks. And when she came to me, she had worked with a lot of glute gurus in the, in the space that, um, she's done their program. She's worked with them individually and she hasn't had a whole lot of success. And really the missing part was just looking at the execution of a lot of her exercises, getting her into a more specific program for her. And over the last eight weeks, it has been insane. It, the The growth to her glutes has been unreal. And I can't wait to unveil the work that she's done. And it's been such a cool transformation as a whole. But that's a, one of those instances where it just comes down to uh, personalization and customization for the client for it really to be successful for them rather than it just being this generic program of like, this grew glutes for this many people, it will work for you too. And it's like, that's just not how it works more often than not. And so that's a really important piece of our one-on-one -on -one coaching. Yeah. And Austin, when it comes to programming for women and men, do you have different exercises that go towards them? Or do you feel like the same exercises can work for both men and women? So me differentiating between sexes, male, female, uh, in terms of, I will call on Alex's answer there as far as their goals, uh, their structure, limb links, all of those things, their anthropometrics, as far as how they're going to be set up, uh, for that exercise in general and what that exercise is really going to maximize within the tissue it may be recruiting uh, or biasing more uh, during those movements. But I would say the other thing is, what do you enjoy doing? I, I think that's a big part of, of weightlifting. I think it's a big part of strength training. And I think that's a big part of, um, you know, whether we look at the enjoyment factor in general and what that plays into people's results, but we also look at sort of the placebo effect of just enjoying something uh, and, and being able to bring some intensity to it. Uh, I know I've been in programs before that were quote unquote optimal and written by someone I trust more than anyone as far as program design goes in the world. But there were a few exercise decisions that I just didn't love. And I made the executive decision on my own to put in, and I did that program for a couple of weeks and I was like, I'm just not, my head's not in it. Like I'm not stoked to go to the gym today. And I don't love that feeling because I'm someone who does enjoy to train uh, and I'm someone that really wants to be excited to go to the gym. So I want to have those exercises in my program. Uh, there's obviously exercises that you may not love. Again, as Alex mentioned there, that you may have to do. Um, but I think as a whole, you should probably line up at least 90% uh, of your exercises with things that you actually enjoy that also complement the goal that you have. 
There's that word again, anthropometrics. <laughs> what does that even mean? I was giving Sue grief on this the other day of just like, <laughs> no one knows what that means. So it's like, why even say it's it? It's a tough word to say, <laughs> really. <laughs> you know? It is the measurement of the human body. So we're talking about your limb lengths and how different proportions in your body are proportioned. Yeah. I, I think that one of the things that we're focusing on, especially as a, as a brand, is not talking over anyone's head. And that's always the thing that I'm like, is that talking over <laughs> anyone's head? Probably. I'm not using it. <laughs> so your body's, your body's structure, it's, are, do you have long arms? Do you have long legs? Do you have a long torso? Like I have really short legs and a super long torso. And so I fold like a lawn chair. So I'm great at squatting. I'm great at any movement that has a squat pattern involved. It's very balanced. It's not overly glute or posterior chain. It's not overly quad. It's just really, really balanced. And so I'm really, really strong in those movements. But also in other ways, I don't leverage other movements quite as well because of those limb links, uh, as you said. I know, I almost said it again. Um, <laughs> but that's, essen you know, that's essentially what we're talking about. Yeah. You know? It's a cool sounding word too. But yeah. it, for instance, like Sue cannot squat, like in terms of like similar to Austin. <laughs> Not entirely. I'm saying that <laughs> yeah. it is a, a little bit more of a pain in the ass for Sue to get set up in a squat and it's she does not fold like a lawn chair. I will say that. Yeah, and that's important to talk about and why we talk about the body structure. And it's not just based on gender. It's based on goal and body structure. Because for myself, I have long femurs and a long torso. And so staying upright when I squat is extremely difficult. So I first have to lean forward. And I had to learn that that's okay, that my squat's going to look different than someone else who has different anthropometrics. <laughs> <laughs> but we are able to still see progression without a squat in place within my training and within my programming. And so when we talk about exercises, which one's best, which one's the favorite, it's also going to depend on you, where even if a squat is an incredible exercise, and I believe that to my core, it's not an incredible exercise for me, because I can't get the output out of it that I can from other exercises. So there's really not a reason to push my body into something that's not going to be as beneficial or optimal. There's no exercise that you have to do. Yeah, there's no exercise you have to do. And I think that plays really well into something that's talked about a lot. If you guys are, you know, maybe a little bit more of the intermediate to advanced listening to this podcast, which is this stimulus to fatigue ratio, something coined by Mike Isretel at Renaissance Periodization. But it's something that like how much stimulus or how much positive stress does a movement put on your muscle or the tissue you're trying to train versus how much does how much fatigue does it accumulate over that set or a series of sets right and we want to have a positive ratio of more stimulus than fatigue ideally in most of our exercises that we're performing but if you don't have the right structure or anthropometrics <laughs> we're going to keep <laughs> nailing down this word if you don't if you don't have a, a structure that's set up let's say for a back squat you know it's like sue or like a lane norton if you guys are familiar with lane norton he has a very bent over good morning looking squat, but he also has a world record, you know, sort of holding squat, at least at some point in his career, right? So it's not that you can't do it. It's just that I'm sure that he was absolutely wrecked every after every single squat session. And I'm sure he is right because there's a lot of fatigue that is going to build because you're fi almost fighting against your structure just to do an exercise, which if your goal is building up massive amounts of strength and expressing strength at a high level, Maybe that's necessary. But if your goal is just to build muscle and improve your body composition, then we should probably choose exercises that better match our structure, better match our goals in general, and have a better stimulus to fatigue ratio as far as the benefit we're getting out of that movement versus the fatigue that we're getting that we have to recover from quick enough to hit that muscle group again the next go. So I think that's an important factor as well. Yeah, I love that. It is summertime. And with summer comes vacations and needing to look like a smoke show at the beach. And that is probably you and wanting to get in the best shape of your life. With Physique Development, our one-on-one -on -one coaching is going to do that for you. So head over to physiquedevelopment.com and inquire to work with one of our coaches. Uh, so you mentioned within goals for physique development that we had the goal of not to talk over someone's head. What were some of the other goals either you personally had this year um, since we're eight months into the year or goals that we had for the business? 
goals that I had. Um, so one of the big things that we had was the the content aspect and being consistent with this, because I think that this has been such a cool experience since we've gotten it really going from a podcast standpoint within YouTube, um, having Miguel here, um, having Enrico getting just started now and uh, David being such a, a pivotal piece of the, the team and, and doing the podcast. And um, this has been one of my big goals that we've been able to stay consistent with in those different factors. Um, from a, I don't know, I, that was, that's kind of the biggest thing. I think that just like, we're more so setting a foundation for our business to catapult. It feels like, mm-hmm. like, it seems like this is a, a grinded out year of, of putting the pieces into place so that we can grow and we can, um, you know, build our name more so as a, as a whole. So that's kind of the things that come to my mind immediately. Did you think it was going to be a grinded out year? No, I never do. Um, I always go into January like this is going to be my year and I'm everything's going to go so easily and it's going to be perfect and nothing can stop me. And um, <laughs> I wouldn't say that everything has gone perfectly or how I expected it to, um, but I'm grateful for everything too. It's like I'm I'm proud of how things have you know, transpired. Not everything has, has gone in our direction type thing, um, but I'm still very grateful for the experience as a whole. Yeah. Austin, what are your personal goals or if you want to tack on to PD's goals that we had for this year? I think content was huge for us. And I, I think all the moves that have been made with, you know, within PD and all of that stuff to to facilitate improving our ability to not only film, but produce and generate and post content across multiple platforms that complements one another, right? And again, stays within our company's ultimate message, which is, again, to not talk over people's heads, to be relatable, to be approachable, and to be friendly, right? And keep our shirts on for the most part, yeah. right? <laughs> um, which, hey, more power to you if you're a shirts off kind of guy or gal, but that's just not the message that we're trying to uh, put forth yeah. quite as much uh, as we once did yeah. uh, on our YouTube channel back in the day, if you guys go back. But I think content was big. I, I think the ability to get ourselves out there and and to become a trusted resource for people, you know, on the internet when they're Googling exercises. And even la- just, just last night, uh, Alex, I'm, I'm sh- I don't know if he showed you or not yet, Sue, but like Alex showed me a couple of messages that people had sent him of like, hey, I are from the, from the TikTok mm-hmm. video that seemingly Went made crazy. Alex famous overnight. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so um, from that video, people were commenting like, I just Googled Bentney RDL, like just that keyword bentney rdl i typed that into google and you guys are the first to come up and there was multiple people like your our video is the only thing that populates see. That's before awesome. the fold and it's not even like one of our biggest videos it's just that's the impact that getting content and putting yourself out there and, and filming high quality stuff can do for you and your brand and becoming a trusted resource so i did the same thing i typed in sumo deadlift and, or I typed in sumo deadlifts for glutes or adduct or whatever I typed in. We are the first video to populate on that. And it's like, you can start to, and I think that was my ultimate goal heading into, um, not just this year, but to, to really, and I, I know I've said this to you guys, which is I want to become as a brand, I want us to become a trusted resource to where when people Google something or type something into YouTube we're within the the top results and and someone sees our branding they see our you know trusted thumbnail they're like oh this is physique i I, i'm gonna go here right over other videos that may be more random that they may have not heard of the company or the person before it doesn't mean those aren't good videos but there's a there's a resonance to the to the person looking up this information that i i think we're starting to gain across the the internet as far as you know, technique videos go, especially. Um, and I'm hoping the podcast becomes that eventually, um, something on the levels of, uh, of like a mind pump or something, but we're, we're reaching for the stars as far as that goes, (laughs) but Hey, I never thought we'd be here. So here we go. Might as well. I will say one thing for my personal goal was, um, getting out of my own way. It's something that I, um, fell into a lot leading into this year was 
using the excuse of I'm too busy to take care of myself. And I would put our you know, physique development, my clients, all of that ahead of myself, not uh, doing as, as well with my food and not getting my training sessions in and just constantly using the excuse of I'm too busy. I've got too many things to worry about and, and putting myself kind of last. And so in January, I made a point to stop doing that, which was uh, very pivotal. My Sue was a huge part of that in terms of just making sure that I, I did eat. Yesterday, I was behind on meals, for example, and I was leaving for an appointment and I had not eaten. And she said, no, 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 you're not leaving. You're going to be late for your appointment <laughs> and you're going to eat. <laughs> Because you so, can't show up here and be small. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> Sometimes that's how you got to show love. <laughs> exactly. And so, yeah, getting out of my own way has been has been huge. And one thing I will say with that is that I haven't just, I made the decision and then every single day I've been out of my own way. <laughs> I will say that I'll have uh, weeks and months maybe that are really good. And then I'll have stretches where I'm like, I'm back to putting myself last and and, and not prioritizing myself, not prioritizing my mental health and, and getting my training sessions in and all those things. And so if you're in the same boat and you can't get the hell out of your own way. Know that it is not just, I make a decision and it's forever different. It's always going to be kind of teetering back and forth. You just want to have longer periods of putting yourself first and prioritizing you than you have of the periods in which you're putting yourself last. And the more that you can shrink those time frames that you're putting yourself last, the better off that you are, the more positive you know actions are going to be transpiring and all that fun stuff. Yeah. And even just an example of that, we took um, a little step back from work um, over this past week and going into it, I was extremely burnt out. It was probably like the other day, you said like five weeks too late. Yeah. And afterwards, I felt so rested. I felt excited. I felt creative and like ready to forge forward. And it was just by taking some time for myself to show up for everyone else. And with that, um, with Alex talking about how I was a huge help with being able to put himself first, that didn't just happen. He had to vocalize what his goals were to me. So if you are sitting here and you're like, oh, I wish I had a friend or a significant other that did that for me, really think about if you've ever vocalized to them before that that's your goal or you want them to hold you accountable. Because when it comes to friends and loved ones, sometimes it's really hard for them to hold you accountable. And especially when it comes to fitness goals, I'll say at least for myself, because I don't want let's say Alex, for him to feel like, oh, Sue is pushing me to do this. She doesn't like the way that I look or she's telling me I need to lose weight or anything like that. I didn't like how I looked. Yeah, <laughs> well, that, that was one part, but I wanted to make sure that I was loving him and caring for him in the way that he wanted to be cared for instead of if he's never told me he either wants to lose weight or be better about his food. And then I'm like, you're not going to eat that because you shouldn't eat any more food today. That could be really hurtful. But since he had shared that with me, I was able to support him in that way. And so make sure you share those things if you want to be supported. Yeah, Sue, I wanted to, to bring that question back on to you because I think it's important for uh, you know us all three to not only have this conversation, but I think it publicly it's helpful like to see just where our goals may may differ, but all come together all at once. So same question back on to you. Did you have any goals that you were pursuing i'm butchering the question but do you have any goals <laughs> that you're wanting to to make happen for physique development uh starting at the first of the year yeah, I would say it probably didn't start at the beginning of the year. So actually on New Year's Eve, we went and we spent time with my sister. And when Alex was pulling the car around for us, because he's such a gentleman, uh, my sister had asked me what my New Year's resolution was. And I said, I really want to work on confidence. And I was talking just on my personal confidence about myself, whether it's about my looks or just like my brute confidence as a whole, how I present myself to others. But even though that goal was set at the beginning of the year, it wasn't translated over to business until the past couple months. And that has continued to be my goal. So it's been cool that I did set it at the beginning of the year, but it wasn't for business. And then it to translate into this confidence that I want to have within the business. Uh, because just to be honest, as we'll, you know, just be vulnerable here, um, I have struggled in the past when it comes to physique development of feeling like, oh, Oh, this is Alex and Austin's brand and I'm kind of just here or I'm Alex's wife, even if they haven't made me feel that way. It's a it's a narrative that runs in my head. And so I felt that I wasn't in a place to take control or to make decisions as well as being in a place where 
I was dealing with my own personal confidence and being a leader and taking on these different positions. And I really had to just show up and decide I'm going to become this person because I could just sit here and have a million excuses about, oh, I shouldn't do this or um, that's not right for me to do or whatever it may be. But if I truly believe in this company, I believe in our mission, I believe in the values that we have, and I know that these other two are my teammates in that, then I'm I'm going to forge forward and have confidence. And even if I don't know what the next best move is, which spoiler alert, no one knows the next best move. We're all just making the best decisions we can with the information we have. And so just being able to have confidence of, I know what I'm doing, or I'm going to figure it out and make the best decision I can. And if more information gets presented to me, then I will change the decision. But I want to become this woman that is like running this business and doing a kick-ass job at it instead of feeling like, oh, like I just kind of do some organizational stuff. It's like, no, Sue, you are going to lead this and you're going to grab it by the freaking balls <laughs> and move forward with it. Mm. So it didn't start at the beginning of the year having that feeling, but it's definitely translated into that feeling. And it's been really exciting. It's been really difficult. Um, we literally talked about it just last night about how the transition from my position has been extremely di difficult for me mentally and psychologically of just navigating through of it's not just my work being judged um, and like dealing with one-on-one -on -one clients and also being able to see that financial goal present within one-on-one -on -one clients and then taking a hit financially of, okay, I'm not working with as many one-on-one -on -one clients and my worth and what I'm pouring into the business being different, that's been really hard to deal with as someone who's extremely successful driven and extremely money driven and having to disconnect from the money and still work just as hard to make sure that the business succeeds. So it's been a really fun year, even though it's been so insane. hard. <laughs> it's been insane and so hard. It's been fun to really grow into our roles and to build upon the foundation and the relationship that Alex Austin and I have and to build upon our relationships with our staff, bring on new staff members, and really just putting in exactly what you said of catapulting this business and putting in the work now. And so many of the projects we're doing feel so fulfilling. They feel like we're on the right track and we're helping the people we want to help. And with Austin talking about um, wanting to Make sure that we're the first thing that pops up or that brand recognition of you trusting PD as a whole. We want to provide so many resources for you. And that's why we do have the TikTok, the Instagram account, um, the business account, as well as all of our personal accounts. Then this podcast, if I didn't already say that. YouTube, we have all of them to really make sure that we can put out valuable information and teach you along the way. So we hope that you've gotten that from us in these past eight months and hopefully before that too, but really seen it in these past eight months because it's been it's been fun to accomplish and to put in the work to get here. Yeah. And I, I would also add to that just the communication aspect of all the three of us as, as well as the entire team has been um, something that I wanted to improve. I don't know if I really outlined it at the beginning of the year type situation, but it's something that we needed to improve on. And we've gotten like dumb better at it, honestly, <laughs> um, over the last eight months as a whole. And I think that like having Miguel here at the house was huge mm -hmm. because one of the things that we ran into with with Austin being remote and then Sue and I being, we live together, we <laughs> eat dinner together, we, you know, we're together all the time. We're married. And so we would have communication uh, issues with the three of us you know, leading or before Miguel got here. And Sue and I are like, I don't know, I don't know what the what the missing part is. Like we're, we're on the same page. Why, why is Austin on? On the same page and it's like you dummies you talk to each other all day how would Austin be on the same page if y'all ain't talking all day so it's a little bit and then once we got Miguel here we're like oh shit. <laughs> that's why we got to talk more we got to be in we got to be you know opening up more and being honest with each other more and all those different things and so Miguel being here there's multiple reasons why Miguel being here is such a pivotal piece that was one of the you know beginning pieces of, of why it was such a, a massive help and all that and, and having one of my favorite people here on a daily basis yeah. is also really <laughs> nice um to to miss so, to miss someone who's at your house on a very regular basis after he wasn't here just for a week, yeah, um, it, it you know speaks volumes.
games and that aspect of things. Because I was like, damn, I miss Miguel. We should invite (laughs) him over. (laughs) None of this content would be possible. We were even looking (laughs) at the video and he was like, this was posted in 2021, but we didn't film that in 2021, did we? He goes, no, we didn't film anything in 2021 <laughs> uh, because we had Miguel in 2020 when we were in uh, Indiana and then we didn't have him all of 2021. So picked it back up, 2022. <laughs> I think you guys covered it. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> all yeah. right. So Coach Austin, how do you know when you should or shouldn't work out when you're sore? Ooh tough one yeah well i think that there's definitely a scale i think there's a lot of ways to answer this question ultimately um i think it's determined i I think in a large way it comes down to kind of what phase you're in like what are you trying to accomplish right like if you're trying to if you're trying to be really explosive and powerful probably very unhelpful to be sore when you're trying to do that, right? There's a lot of physiological things that are down-regulated or, or don't work up to the capacity they, they should be working at because they're trying to deal with that damage and get themselves back to either baseline or, you know, hopefully improve or adapt above baseline before you return back to trying to be explosive and powerful. Um, I'd say if you have a, a very strength-driven goal, I would say that's going to also be on the side of you don't want to be overly sore when you're trying to express a high level of strength because again you need uh, a component of that explosive power within strength expression right that's that's a part of strength um but I, i think where the scales start to tip is if your goal is is to build muscle or to improve body composition Obviously, you can, if you're debilitatingly sore, you should probably take a couple plays off, right? Like chill out for a second. Also recalibrate your programming to the fact that why are you this sore, right? <clears throat> so unless it's the first week of a program or a new, a new program or a new phase, you probably shouldn't be sore for three, four days plus in a phase, right? Ideally, in the first week of a phase, you're not sore for that long either. But sometimes there's some um, overreaching or maybe you miscalibrate some volume. Maybe it's a new exercise that has a very high stimulus to fatigue uh, relationship, right? Where it's like, oh, I went from, for my lower training, I went from just all machine work, leg extension, leg curl work for my, for my legs to, well, now I'm back squatting, split squatting, leg pressing, doing all of these things where it's like, even if volume is equated, you're going to be significantly more sore from those exercises relative to the machine-based ones because of many factors, right? Which I don't want to make this answer any longer. (laughs) But when it comes to allowing yourself to ultimately adapt and grow and become stronger or build more muscle, ideally, we're breaking down things or we're training things in a way where we're also allowing them to recover fully or full enough, right? Fully enough before we train them again, before we break them and tear them down again, right? Because as you always say, Sue, um, what is it? Train Train hard, hard, recover recover harder. harder. Yeah. And Alex Nailed hit him it. with the, um, you can only grow what you can recover from. Yeah. And I think that the, like, that's one big thing within our programming as well is that people will come to us of like, I've been trying to put on tissue for so long and they are so inflamed and they're like, my sleep sucks. My digestion sucks. And they're like, I, I I'm just training and I'm always sore. And we immediately drop the volume, get them into a more more recovery-based stimulus, and then actually start to progress the volume adequately or in a manner that they're actually able to recover from. And all of a sudden, their skin brightens up, their digestion improves, they're not as inflamed. All of a sudden, they're getting stronger, um, they're happier. All these things, it's crazy. All the biofeedback improves and, and we're able to see better progress over time. That was spooky. The next question was, what are signs of overtraining? <laughs> Look at that. Uh, <laughs> signs of overtraining. You got this, Austin? Go ahead. Well, I wanted to mention something about training volume before that, um, just because I I think it's important because there's a lot of information floating around about training volume, about 
how many sets per week you should do, you know, is should it be 10, should it be 12, should it be 14, 16, 18, 20 plus sets per week per muscle group? And the answer to that is you need to judge that and base that off of what have you been doing most recently, right? Have you been training at all? Well, you probably shouldn't start with <laughs> 15, 16, 20 yeah. plus sets per week per muscle group because your baseline is zero currently. Um, so it would be productive to start around eight to 10 to 12 sets per week, uh, obviously depending on exercise selection, your ability to train, your training age, have you trained in the past, all of those things are important factors. But if you have been, let's say, you've been someone who's training two times, three times per week, maybe doing a full body program, you're kind of just a a casual gym goer, someone who's gone to the gym because it's something you like to do that makes you feel good, but you've never gone above and beyond as far as pushing yourself in the gym. Let's say that's around six to eight sets per week per muscle group. And then you sign up with a coach and that coach puts you into a program with 18 to 20 sets per muscle group per week. That's not going to go well. <laughs> You're going to be debilitatingly sore. And a lot of those biofeedback markers are going to start to plummet. Obviously, this is individual. But I think you can start to see the issue with our body's ability to handle stress and our body's ability to handle these physiological uh, physiological stressors as a whole, right? Because whether you're running, you know, going out and running long distances or going into the gym and training super hard or, you know, going out and getting in a boat and rowing yourself down the down the river or whatever the hell you do for your fitness there's a level of having to titrate that volume of work, whatever that work is, up according to where you started as a baseline, right? So going from one end of the continuum being the low end all the way up to the high end of that continuum and skipping that entire middle bit is fairly unproductive way of looking at it. So relative to training volume and volume of work that you're performing in any type of fitness or exercise, it should be appropriately titrated up from the baseline that you're currently at starting from or relative to what you know, experts are saying or what the research says is optimal for X, Y, and Z, because there's a lot of caveats within those things. Um, but there is actually research to support what I'm saying right now. But yeah, I thought that was important to touch on. And I love that you touch on that because if you listen to either the first or second episode that I did with Coach Courtney earlier this month, we talked about anything that you're changing within your life, you do need to take inventory of what it is relative to you. And that's not only to be able to make the change and sustain it, but to be able to see success. So like Austin said, if you were to go in and you're starting at zero and you go to that other end of the spectrum with the, it's any of those activities. Activities he talked about, first, you're not going to be recovered to probably train for another week plus, but it's also not sustainable. You're not seeing that progress forward. And that one really, really hard session didn't make up, so to speak, for those other six days that you weren't able to move your body. And so any change that you're making in your life, really thinking about how is this relative to me, instead of thinking, oh, experts say I should hit 10,000 steps. If you're only taking 2,000 steps a day, aim for 3,000, aim for 4,000, and that is going to allow you to see more success than feeling like you need to bite off so much more than you can chew, because that's also kind of the aspect of that all or nothing. And I know within my own fitness journey where I would go all in for two weeks, and I would go from literally doing nothing to trying to do everything, and then wondering why I got burnt out or why it didn't last past two weeks or when it didn't last past a month, when it was really because I was not setting myself up for success in the name of trying to see success. Are you wanting to hire the last coach you will ever need? Well, look no further. Physique Development is here to help you. We have a huge emphasis on knowledge and communication and making sure you know how to get yourself in the best position so you never have to hire another coach again. If this sounds great to you, then go ahead and fill out the inquiry link in the show notes or the description box, and we would love to get on a call with you. All right. So what are your guys' thoughts on overcoming rest day anxiety, or do you guys personally deal Deal with rest day anxiety. Oh, I look forward to my rest day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> with my with rest day anxiety, I I don't know if I've ever experienced this. To be honest with you, I think that um, I don't know. I, I feel like 
since we started really training, it's been something that I feel like I get more bent out of shape if I have a scenario where I miss sessions, Mm -hmm. where it's like I was supposed to train yesterday and I have anxiety about that rather than it being like, this is my rest day. Because on the rest days, things that we recommend to our clients, things that we put um, into place ourselves is going to be still getting activity in, uh, still going out and getting our walks in, playing with the dogs, uh, getting all the work and things that we already have on our to-do list done. Um, so I don't have as, as much rest day anxiety as much as I do of, of I planned on hitting a session and things just didn't go my way. Um, I have anxiety around that. I guess working around that is something that just comes with time where you have to, you know, make a decision for yourself of these things are also important to me. And this is what the priority was for this day. And unfortunately I wasn't able to get my training session in. I'll just push it to the next day. And I think that that comes with time because, um, you can get into a very negative headspace, you know, missing sessions, especially if it's multiple in a row. I mean, I've had that happen to me as well, where Monday and Tuesday, I'm planning to hit a great session on Monday. I'm looking forward to it and craziness erupts within, within work. And it's like, well, None of none of the training is going to happen today. And then Tuesday, I'm like, all right, finally, I'm going to get my session in. And then Tuesday's crazy. And I'm like, I hate this. This sucks. Um, and so then, you know, moving it to Wednesday. So it's, it's one of those things that you just got to, I guess, learn with time. Yeah. Austin, did you ever struggle with rest anxiety or currently struggle with it? I don't think so. I am sure I had, um, I'm sure I felt odd not going into the gym. Uh, on days that I, I had as rest days or days that I weren't, weren't, that were more dedicated to not training, uh, more formally, but I think I've trained when I, when I've been training, right. There's definitely months at a time throughout my most recent history of life or chapter of life, let's say over the last five years where I've gone months without really training very much. Right. And I think I got more anxious during that time period when I was almost, out of sync with with that part of me, which has been such a big part of my life since I was four or five years old. I mean, I started contact sports when I was five years old. <clears throat> I started going to practice three, you know, three sport, uh, e- uh, playing three sports year round since I was five years old, six years old. So I think that is such a big part of who I am and how I show up and, and where a lot of my self-confidence comes from is, is being physically able and strong and, and feeling capable, right, physically. Because I think that's what I have just driven a lot of my life forward um, throughout, my, throughout my time here. So I think being out of sync gave me more, more anxiety than planned rest days ever did. Um, and also just being a, putting yourself in a position where I'm also someone that I... I guess I get anxiety around rest days if I know I didn't put the proper work in on my training days. And I, th- I think that's an important thing that's to, important, to potentially yeah. mention. If you are having anxiety around rest days, really start to, to take inventory and audit what you're doing at the gym or within your exercise or fitness when you are training. Because it's it's like, well, I have... It's, it's maybe a cross comparison to like sleep or something else where it's like, well, I just feel guilty for going to sleep because I didn't do anything all day. Right. But when you when you got everything done or you you really were knocking yourself out <clears throat> or maybe not even like <clears throat> ticking boxes, but you were you were working hard, you were doing the deeds, right? You were showing up for what you needed to show up for. And you're you're physically and mentally exhausted by the end of the day. You're craving sleep. Like you're like, dude, this is all I've wanted to do is to lay down and just allow my body to shut off until the morning, right? And I think that's the same thing with with training is like, if you've done the work and you've put in the effort and you've showed up for yourself and that you've matched that effort with the expectation you set from yourself or of yourself, your rest day is a reward. Your rest day is something that you look forward to more or less and you do something else with that time. Maybe you do more work, uh, maybe you catch up on some things or maybe, you get out into nature, you go outside, you get some sunshine, you play with your dogs, you hang out with a friend. Um, one of my, my one of my activities I'm doing right now on my rest day is playing golf uh, with a buddy. I, I do that one time a week. It's always on a rest day for me. Um, and so I, I still get activity. I'm still walking around a golf course. I'm still outside. I'm still experiencing all of those things. I'm experiencing 
um, you know, friendship and, and communication and like being close to somebody and, and sharing a, a sport that I, neither of us are very good at, but we're trying to be better at, um, you know, that's a good experience in general. Um, so I think if you're having anxiety around rest days, maybe audit, maybe that's not the only thing, but maybe the first thing you do is audit the work that you're doing the rest of the week and be sure that that matches up to something that would have you be a little bit less anxious about your rest day because you're just exhausted and you're, you're ready for it relative to you being, you feeling guilty or shameful for taking it because you've sort of slacked off the rest of the week. Yeah. And I think that uh, for myself, I haven't, if I'm recalling correctly, struggled too much with being afraid to take days off from the gym. And I'm very thankful that pretty early in my lifting career uh, that I was told that rest was really important. And I also was extremely busy during that time. I was in class and had like 21 credit hours while also prepping for a competition while also working a part-time job. And so I really welcomed those rest days because exactly what these two are talking about is because I worked so hard, I did feel like I was good to take those and I'd put in the work that I needed. And we say that a lot when it comes to physique development is, hey, if you're putting in the work that you need to in the gym, you don't need more than five training days. And if you are not, then yeah, you could stretch that across six or seven, but are you getting adequate rest to really see that growth that you need? And then also, what does that hammer into your mentality? All those other things. So um, I, I don't think I've personally dealt with it. Um, and I would recommend to just really look at how you are training and asking yourself why you have that anxiety. Is it because you're afraid you're going to lose your results? Is it because you feel like you just need to keep working harder? Be able to figure out what the the root of that is. And then when you do, drop into one of our three DMs and let us know so that we can help you or provide a resource for you to figure that out so it's a little bit easier for you and you're not having that anxiety. Because we've all experienced anxiety and it's no fun. So we'd love to be able to help you out a little bit with that. Um, and that brings us to our last question, which is asking, what do you feel like are the top reasons why people don't make progress? And I'll go ahead and start. And one of the top reasons I feel like people don't make progress in the gym is they're focusing too much on how much they lift more than how they lift. So they're not focusing on that execution and really being able to figure out what is going to be best for them, how they're going to get that tension on the muscle to truly see that progress that they want to see. I would say that it is going to come down to consistency. And I know that I'm stealing this from Austin and I can feel that this is what he was thinking he was going to say. Um, and what I mean by that is that everyone is seeking the most optimal scenario of their, of their training, of their nutrition, and, and trying to find this perfect setting for them to be able to accomplish their goal. And the reality is that that's never going to come. There may be sessions that are perfect where you have uh, great execution and, and you had the perfect pre-workout meal and you timed your post-workout meal perfectly and you got to bed at the perfect time and woke up at the perfect time. But more often than not, you're going to get like one of those five things and still have to go forward and, and still get the job done. Maybe, you know, sometimes you get more than that, but the reality is that you're only going to get a couple of those. And the more that that you're able to work through those things and, and show up even when you don't want to is when you're going to really accomplish the goals that you want to accomplish. Yeah. And I, I think, <clears throat> you know, I, I'll, I'll, I'll div our, uh, go away from the two things that you guys said here and, and just say effort, not matching expectation. And I, I think ultimately a lot of our effort or a lot of the things that we want to accomplish in life that we don't or that take a lot longer is because we're not putting the same effort into them at which we expect ourselves uh, to succeed more or less, right? And so it takes a lot of effort to be consistent, right? And I think effort in a big way is at the top, um, sort of the umbrella of a lot of things that we want to accomplish uh, within, let's say, fitness specifically, but in our life in general. Right. So if you're wanting to see progress in the gym, it takes effort to set up your day in a way where you can be consistent. It takes effort to set up your day to be sure that you can get in, you know, more than one of those five things that Alex mentioned and getting you have to be able to also and you also have to be able to, to roll with the punches. Right. So that and to me is effort as well, because it takes a lot of mental effort to get over your own. BS 
of, oh, everything wasn't perfect today. Everything didn't go my way. What was me? Tomorrow's always a new day. And it's like, yes, that's true. But also today is still today. You still have an opportunity to do the things that you told yourself you were going to do, right? And you have to make a judgment call there, obviously. Like, don't stay up. If you have to get up at 6 a.m., don't stay up till 3 a.m. getting in your gym session or X, Y, and Z. But like, there's parts of my journey and a a Alex's journey, I know specifically, like, we, <laughs> like, even when I, we were competing, like, I was maybe like a month out, weeks out from a show. I would still have that mentality. And I think that although it wasn't always productive, I think towards the end goal, it was the it was the point of the effort. It was the point of the consistency that kept me mentally there where I would at that time stay up till midnight, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., although I know I had to get up at six to go to work. There were nights just to get my lift in because I knew I had to get it in because mentally I needed it. I needed it there and I needed that effort to match my expectation of what I expected of myself at that time. Right. I remember the night I PR'd, um, yeah. you That's came That's still back on the from, YouTube channel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's still on the YouTube channel. So the night that we both PR'd on deadlift mm -hmm. that night, um, that was the night that I, I hit 600 or I think it was 600 or, or maybe a little like that. 605 or whatever yeah. that was. Um, that was at 2 a.m. Yeah. And I ended up having to work at four. I had to get up for work at 4.30 a.m. because I was working at the hospital at the time. So I actually didn't sleep for 48 hours yeah. during that period of time because of what I expected of myself. And at that time, I had zero, zero excuses that I allowed for myself. And again, was that the best relationship to have with it? Maybe at that time for me, it, maybe it was. Mm -hmm. is, that the best, is that the best relationship for you to have for your fitness journey right now? Maybe not. And if you're listening to this and you're not putting yourself into a, you know, a, a tiny swimsuit on stage in front of, you know, however many people are going to be there and, and whatever else and having a panel of judges just pick your body apart, you probably just shouldn't <laughs> put that much effort into that. You sh maybe you should reprioritize your expectations, right? And I, I think that's two sides of that coin, right? So effort needs to match expectations, but expectations need to also match the effort you're able to put in at that given time or that given season of life. So I think that's an intimate relationship that you can get help with if you have a coach or a personal trainer. That's in a, in a big way what we're trained to do is to take inventory. You know, we've worked with thousands of people. We've, with, for thousands of people, we've taken inventory of their life through questionnaires and intake forms and weekly conversations to be able to break that down and say, hey, look, I know you have the expectation to train seven days per week and you have the expectation to lose 60 pounds in 30 days. The effort, one, is that even possible? Probably not. The effort alone with three kids and two jobs and the fact that you're going to, to school at night and the fact that X, Y, and Z, look, let's not do that to ourselves. Let's reprioritize. Let's re program our expectations that way our effort can actually match right because in a big way that's where a lot of our self-esteem and self-confidence and belief within ourselves comes from right and i think that's that plays a huge role within our ability to to achieve things in life and it plays a huge role in our ability to continue continuously and consistently show up for ourselves uh, to put that effort in to max that expectation to then lead ultimately my voice still cracks apparently <laughs> to lead ultimately to what sue said of being able to focus in the gym and bring a level of focus and intention and intensity to our lifts instead of just going through the motions. So I think all of those kind of come together uh, in an intimate and appropriate way uh, to kind of come full circle. Yeah. And one of the questions that we didn't get to was what's our ideal client? And it's someone who's done making excuses and is ready to learn about their health and make that change. So if you are interested in that, then the inquiry link is going to be in the bio. And then you can get on a free call with us and we can see if you're going to be a good fit for us to be able to help you. So thank you so much for tuning into the podcast. Make sure that you give it a review and you subscribe, download it. All that stuff helps us. If you're watching on YouTube, subscribe, thumbs up, comment, and thank you so much. We'll catch you in the next one.